computer science, so sorry, I'm not a physicist. And uh, it's really uh, an honor and a pleasure to be the chair for this session. Uh, so, this professor's mission, second lecture. Thank well, thank you very much. Um, Okay, so in the first lecture I talked mainly about entanglement and quantum computing, and today I want to talk mainly about Clifford circuits. Um, and I want to begin actually by saying some things about weak and strong simulations. And I know that um, weak and strong simulations have been mentioned in other lectures, Leandro and Ernesto. So if you're a student here just beginning in this subject, this should make you very happy that um, the same things keep coming up because it means the subject is not just this infinite array of all separate and interesting things, but there is some cohesion and, and maybe with some polynomial effort you can expand your understanding and reach the boundary of our knowledge and start to come up with some great new ideas too. So. Um, so, that, so to begin with, some, and I'll say a bit more about weak and strong simulations than has already been said, um, because it will feature quite significantly in, in my later uh, things I want to say about Clifford circuits and match gate circuits also next time. Um, Uh, okay, so so remember we had this idea of a, a description of a quantum computation, uh, which amounts to the list of the gates, the the lines on which they act, a description of what the input should be, usually a, either a computational basis state or a product state of n qubits, and which lines should be measured for the output. It could be one line for a yes-no decision problem, or it could be more, and that, that's a significant difference there. So it could be as many as n, you could measure them all, for example. And capital N, circuit size, which is just the number of gates, little n is the number of qubit lines, and if we have families of these things, we normally consider polynomial size circuits, where the circuit size is just gross polynomially with number of lines. Okay? So it's all very familiar stuff, and so the the total length of this whole description only grows polynomially as well. To write it down, on, you only need polynomially number of pages of your notebook to, to write that down. Um, you know, suppose we have a universal, a finite universal set of gates. You just have to say what the names are and so on. Okay, so so. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if there are continuous parameters, I don't want to kind of confuse things by getting excessively formalized here. It will always suffice to specify continuous parameters also to poly n digits for n qubit lines. Okay, notice this is exponential precision though, you should be aware of that. Because if you have a number to n digits, right, like decimal number, that the last digit is 10 to the minus n. Right? It's not 1 over n, it's, ten to, it's exponentially small in n. So, so we're, we're asking for exponential precision, but it only takes polynomial effort to write it down, so that's fine. Um, okay, so now we come to our weak and strong simulation. A weak, efficient simulation is, given this description here, we, we want to produce a sample of the output distribution that it produces, but we don't want to do it by implementing this quantum process in the lab. We want to do it by purely classical means, on a classical randomized computer. And furthermore, it should run at most with a polynomial overhead in, in what the quantum process would run with. So this could be polynomial little n or capital N because of this. So we can sort of blur the distinction. We're always happy to accept polynomial overheads, but not exponential ones. Okay, so that's, that's a weak simulation. And then strong simulation is, um, instead of just sampling, we want to calculate any output probability to, to k digits in poly time as well, where the precision to k digits is also polynomial like this. Now, I emphasize here that not only, if you've got more than one output line, not only do we demand that we get the output probabilities, uh, but we want all the marginal probabilities as well. Now that's a non-trivial distinction because suppose you have n output lines, there are two to the n outcomes, right? 
So if you can suppose you can compute all the two to the n probabilities easily, right, um, the marginal of the first line is the sum of exponentially many of those. Right, to, to compute the marginal for the first line. So even if you can compute all the probabilities separately, quickly, you can't compute that marginal that way. So it's a non-trivial extra constraint to say that I can also compute the marginal. And we'll see in a moment why we ask for that too. Of course, if there's only one output line or a finite number that doesn't grow with n, there's no difference. You know, the marginal doesn't cause a problem. Because you know, one output line doesn't have any marginal for part of it. So, um, so, okay, so, and, I, and this has been mentioned before, if you actually run the quantum process itself, it doesn't give you this, it only gives you a, a sample of the output. So, so it's the weak simulation that's kind of equivalent to having no computing benefit in the quantum process. Um, and strong simulation provides a lot more. So, so now it's interesting to consider the relation between these two, and by virtue of the name, you would expect that strong simulation implies weak simulation, but not unless you have the marginals, so this is why you want the marginals. So you see, because if you have n ample lines, you have two to the n probabilities, and if you can, even if you calculate each of these exponential ones easily, how do you sample from that distribution? You know, uh, you haven't got time to calculate them all. And even if, even if you calculated them all, how do you, how do you sample from a huge pile of two to the n probabilities, right? Um, so here's the trick. So you can do it, though, efficiently, if you've got the marginals. So you simply use Bayes' rule. If, if you think of the outputs in order, you know, the usual Bayes' rule thing, probability of xk given the values of the previous one is the probability of the whole lot divided by the probability of the condition thing. Right? And it's a quotient of two marginals. So the colours go slightly peculiar when you go from one computer to another study. Um, I'm not... I don't mean marginals, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm not emphasising that, that's all. Uh, uh, well, a well, well, good thing to do to keep your attention of the audience. Um, so, um, so, so, so using Bayes' rule now, we just do the following trick. The probability that we want to sample from, the whole thing, um, here it is, and I divide by one less and put it up there, and then one less and put it up boom, 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 like that. And all of these quotients are conditional probabilities. So the probability of, of the whole lot is the probability of x1 times x2 given the value of x1 times x3 given the two previous ones all the way up to this one here. So, so now you can see how we um, actually uh, can sample efficiently. What we, remember we can calculate any marginal easily, right? But we can't, we don't want exponentially many of them, we can't do that. So you calculate this marginal, P of X1, and you sample it, you toss the coin or whatever, and then you get, a, get an X1 value that you see. Then you calculate the probability of X2 given the one you saw, that's just another two marginals, just a question of another two marginals, and you sample that. Then you calculate the probability of X3 given the, the two that you've already seen, and that's just another two marginals, and sample that, and all the way down, and, and then if you do that, then this previous formula says that when you finish, you've, you've actually sampled your distribution, and at each step, you've only had to calculate two marginals, and even better, one of them you calculated in the previous step, the top line of that's the same as the bottom line here. So, so you need only like n marginals, so it's very efficient, and, and away you go. So, so it's certainly true that strong implies weak if you've got marginals, but the other way around, we don't expect weak to imply strong. Of course, you can't prove anything in complexity theory, really, but you can expect things, right? So you expect this because if it were true, P would equal NP, or, or even worse, sharp P. So and, and the reason is very, very simple. Um, consider a Boolean function. Uh, you know, of n bits to 1 bit. So there are two to the n inputs to this function, the n bit strings, and the answer is just 0 or 1, okay? And let sharp f be the number of x's input which give 1 as your output, okay? So that's some number between 0 and 2 to the n, right? So, um, and suppose you're given f as a polysized circuit or a formula or whatever, um, it's known that it's classically very, very hard to compute sharp f. In fact, it's 
it's so hard that all of MP could be computed if you could do that efficiently. Okay? It's so-called MP complete. So I don't want to go into saying what MP is and what sharp P is, um, but it, it's also sharply hard to compute this number. For NP, you only need to know whether it's zero or not, you know, which is a slightly less than the actual number of information. Um, so, uh, but on the other hand, um, so now let's look at the following thing. Um, so suppose we have the usual quantum oracle, you know, for computing these Boolean functions. It's the unitary transform with an n cubic register, the input register, and the output register. This should be familiar, hopefully. And you run it once, and, it, and the input goes through, and the output gets added to the second register. So it computes the function in this sense. Um, and suppose that's some polytime computation. Then consider the following input register. I haven't actually put in, you know, written the formulas, but it's because it's so simple. You start with n plus 1 qubits in state 0. You apply Hadamard's to the first n of them. So you've got the uniform superposition of all the x's, right, sitting there. And then you compute the function, and you get the uniform superposition of this over all x's, or all the values in superposition. And then you measure the last qubit, and clearly the probability of seeing 1 for that measurement in the last qubit is precisely the number of ones there are out of the 2 to the n equally weighted terms in that superposition. So, so here's a nice simple process and, and weak simulation is easy for this. Um, so weak simulation, you, you don't do it, you throw all this quantum stuff away and you don't do Hadamard, you just toss coins. You, you randomly you, you pick a, an n-bit string x uniformly at random, compute the function, and output its value. And the probability is, is the same probability, right? Because it's a random string, and the probability that you're going to get one that evaluates to 1 is precisely the, the number that there are, like that. So, so, but, so if you could do an efficient, strong simulation of this weakly simulatable thing, then you could evaluate this thing to n digits in poly time, because that's what you can do with strong simulations. You compute probabilities to good accuracy. Uh, but then, um, from this quotient, since you've got it to n digits, uh, you can actually get the value of sharp f here, and, and hence you'd collapse p and np and sharp p. So, so that can't be done. Okay, so, so that's a typical sort of complexity argument there. Um, oh, yes, yeah, so... Uh, Actually, yeah, so another remark here, which has come from the slide, is remember last time I talked about the chernoff hoofding bound, which Leandro called the large deviation bound, or Chebyshev inequality. It's the same thing. I hope you recognize the, the same formula there. Um, so what that, in, what that tells you, it's a way of estimating the probability by sampling the distribution. So, so that seems to be relevant here, because suppose I can weakly um, simulate something, that means I can sample it. So surely I can estimate the probability now by using this large deviation bound. I'll just keep on sampling it and then take the average, you know, the, the number of ones and so on. So, so why doesn't that work, you know, to, to show that weak implies strong simulation? So the, the, so the crucial fact is, is the error, is you know, the, the number of runs that you need to do, the number of samples you need to do to get a, a good um, accuracy of the probability. So remember, and I'm not going to write the whole formula down, so um, if you run it polynomial, so I, I'm only allowed to really sample polynomially many times because I'm not allowed to do more work than that, right? So if I sample it polynomially many times, and then look at the fraction of ones. That will give me an estimate um, of, of the probability, but with high probability. So let's just suppose it's, it's immensely high. I, you know, we, we don't worry about that being not quite one. But the accuracy, the additive error, goes as one over the square root of the number of ones, the number of runs. And that's also polynomial. You know, square roots of polynomials are polynomial too. So, um, so therefore, I can, I can efficiently, from a weak simulation, get a, an estimate of the probability up to this accuracy, 
But that's not good enough because 1 over poly n is only log n digits and not n digits. And, and you see in this, um, uh, in this expression here, if, if I've only got this number to log n digits, it's hopeless because if this number is 1, the 1 only appears down at the nth place and I won't see it. So I can't, I don't have enough accuracy to tell even if this is zero or not. So, so that, that's how that method doesn't work. In, in order to get the accuracy that I do need, I have to sample it exponentially many times, and then it's fine, then you get your extra digits. But you're not allowed to work that hard, right? You, you, you haven't got that much time to sample me, take that many samples. Uh, okay, so, so that's my preliminary about um, uh, weak and strong simulation. And now I want to move on to uh, power antithetic groups. And you normally encounter this for Q bits in most books and everything. Um, but just for fun, I'm going to introduce it for Q dits. Um, and you might think, well, that's just silly. It's just kind of writing a letter the other way around. But, but in fact, it's, um, it's hugely different. Um, Q bits behave differently from Q dits. Um, uh, and I'm going to consider dimension that's a prime number. And of course, 2 is a prime. But 2 is the only even prime number. And as such, it, it's a complete pain in the neck because the whole the theory behaves rather differently because of that. Um, uh, and often we only see the qubit case and assume everything just goes through for qubits, but it doesn't. Um, so, and we'll see a few of these. I don't want to kind of labour that, but but it's, it's also interesting to see this more generalised version. So, so for q for d dimensions now, introduce the d root of unity, you know, the first one there. Um, and then we have these vial operators, which are like our Pauli operators. There's an X and a Z, which are the analogues of the usual X and Z. And the X simply bumps you up by one. So just like in, in a two-dimensional case, you add one mod D. So its matrix is, is this. It says a row of ones, you know, just below the diagonal, everything else is zero. Because zero gets mapped to one, one gets mapped to two, two gets mapped to three, and n gets mapped to, or sorry, d gets mapped back to zero, which is a, um, or sorry, d minus one gets mapped back to zero. And these, these numbers go from zero up to d minus one, because it's modulo d. Um, so that's my x, you know, the natural generalization. And the z operator, well, it's this phase thing, we just take powers of, of this root of unity down diagonal here. Okay, that's also, for d equals 2, these do give you precisely your favourite, you know, familiar powers. And it's easy to show that, you know, you get these commutation relations, zx is omega xz. Um, if you bump it up by one and then apply the phase with the, the appropriate power, uh, that's the same as applying the lower phase, bumping it up by one, but then you haven't got the higher power, so you've got to stick another omega up. So it's not easy to verify these things. And of course, the d powers of these things are obviously the identity. If you if you add d mod d, you you don't do anything. And here, all these roots of unity, the d powers are, are one, so you pick up the identity. Um, so so these are our basic so-called vial operators or vial Heisenberg operators or Pauli operators or or we can attach our own name to them, I guess. <laughs> um, so the Pauli group then for one q dit is for for odd d greater than two. So so now comes a, a funny thing, um, a difference with q bits. Um, it's the group generated by these two things. You know, you consider all products of them under multiplication and powers of products. And of course, these relations limit. You know, very much what you get. Um, it's just amazing. The entire theory I'm going to talk about now follows completely from these simple algebraic relations, just taken abstractly. Um, just these two very simple algebraic relations have you know, wonderful consequences. So, um, so a typical element might look like z to the a, x to the b, you know, the products of these things. Because if you have strings of x and z, you can commute them around at the expense of adding in extra phases and stick all the z's next to each other and all the x's next to each other. 
Um, and, and you have arbitrary multiples by omega of anything in this group because um, x inverse and z inverse are the d minus 1 powers because of this, right? x times x to the d minus minus i, so on. So if I multiply here on the left by x inverse and on the right by z inverse, these guys, I get this, but then that just leaves me omega. So in fact, multiplying anything by omega is also in my group too, in, in this Pauli group. So you get arbitrary phase you know, powers of this thing. So that's the Pauli group for one q dit. Now if you play the same game for, uh, for d equals 2, for q bits, you don't get what we normally regard as the Pauli group because in the case of two dimensions, x and z are, um, uh, x and z are completely real, right? Uh, because omega, the, the square root of, um, of 1 is minus 1, the, the, you know, this is the first square root there. So, uh, actually, no, well, I'll come to that in a moment, so, uh, uh, yeah, so I should start the same now. So, just put that on hold for a second. So, uh, I just want to write down a few more relations here. So, in this group, so we have these elements, so we're d odd bigger than 2. So, we have these elements, and it's interesting to compute the commutation relations of these things. And if you have, you know, z to the a, x to the b, z to the c, x to the d, you can com commute these guys across here. Each time gives you a, a minus omega, because it's that way around, and there are c, z's that have each got to go across b, x's, so you get omega to the minus 1 b, c times, and then all the z's are next to each other and the x's are next to each other, so you get that, which is that. And similarly the other way around, the, the b and the c here is now a and d, so you get omega to minus a, d there, and, and hence you easily derive this, this relation. Um, so you get this curious kind of determinant combination of these integers coming in, which is very characteristic of the mathematical structure of the, this whole situation. Um, so for qubits, coming back to qubits now, uh, x and z, you know, 0, 1, 1, 0, and so on, and 1, minus 1 on the diagonal, they're both real. So if you consider the group generated by those, you, you don't get y you know, the usual Pauli y, which has got complex number in it. So, in fact, you have to throw in i as well to get the usual group. I mean, if we didn't do that, we would get a, a so-called Pauli group that's different from the one we normally use. It, it, it's only got real things in it. Instead of r, y, you'd have i times y in, in there, which is real. Um, but if we continued with that, then looking slightly ahead, when we, when we ask about Cliffords, which are going to be you know, things that preserve Pauli's, you, would you wouldn't get this Clifford that we, we always like to have, this kind of special complex diagonal thing. This Clifford only arises if you, if you enlarge the group here in this way. But, but no such problem occurs with odd Ds. So this, this is kind of curious here. So for D equals 2, I is of course only to the half. It's not just omega. Um, but for odd d, the power half here is actually an integer, so it doesn't make any difference if we require halves, because 2 to the half is, you know, 1 half is, is the multiplicative inverse of 2 mod d. And it's just d plus 1 over 2, because look, if d is odd, d plus 1 is even. So d plus 1 over 2 is, is a whole number, it's not a fraction. Um, and then that's a half in, in, this, in this algebra of multiplication mod d. Uh, and of course, if you multiply it by 2, the 2's can cancel, if you like, and you get d plus 1, which is 1 mod d. So it really is a half. Um, you know, for example, mod 5, um, you know, 5 minus 6 over 2 is 3, so 3 equals a half, because 3 times 2 is 6 which is 1 mod 5. So 3 times 2 is 1, so 3 must be a half. Uh, 
But for only for d equals 2, that doesn't work, and you don't get an integer, so it's a complete headache, really. Um, so you could have uniformly defined uh, all the Pauli groups, not like, uh, not like this, but um, it's generated by x and z and the square root of omega. And that makes no difference here, because the square root of omega is just some power of this one, but it makes a difference for q bits. Uh, okay, so, and you might think, oh gosh, I've thrown in this extra i for qubits. Why don't I just throw in more phases, you know, and make life even more interesting? Well, you can do that, you get a slightly bigger group, but it doesn't buy you anything at all for later purposes, because if you, when we come to Clifford's, when you look at the normalizer of that group, you know, the things that leave it very under conjugation, the new phases don't give you anything new there beyond what you already get from these guys, but for d equals 2, the i here does give you something new than what, than if you don't have it. So, so you get this slightly tricky situation. Um, okay, so, so we don't want any more phases, so that, that's, that's enough. Um, uh, so yeah, so quantum theory q bits um, look rather different from q dits. Uh, so mathematically, it's because two is the only even prime, um, and so physically, you know, th this mathematical distinction will be reflected in their physics as well. So it's kind of bit like that. Uh, you know, two-level systems that behave differently from three-level systems in various crucial ways, and we'll see this again in the third lecture when I talk about match games. So. So, uh, but in, in classical computer science, you can use any base, I guess it seems. I don't know of any, anyone who worries about base 2 versus base 3, you know, um, and so on. Uh, okay, so the Pauli, so this is all on one Q dit. If you have n Q dits, uh, <coughs> either 2 or odd, uh, you, you just do the usual thing. You take the tensor product of, of the single Pauli's n times of the n, n q dit lines. Okay, so now any element has a form like this TAB, except that you've got this ZX thing in each slot. So you've got NAs and NBs to describe it. So it's like draw vector lines under them here. And, and the phase out the front is plus or minus one, plus or minus i for q bits. And it's just any some power of omega for q dits, for, for odd q dits. Okay, so that's how you describe the <coughs> element. And, and the commutation relation now is before we had this AD minus BC, this now appears from each slot separately, and you get this so-called so symplectic <coughs> inner product, which is just the sum of these things. So you have these two vectors in integers mod d to length 2n, 2n of them, um, and, uh, and, and this expression appears up here. So, and then associated to that, this funny quadratic expression is the so-called symplectic group, which is the group of all matrices of the appropriate size, which preserve this inner product on the conjugation, uh, um, preserve the inner product when they act on, on the vectors. In just the same way that the orthogonal group is defined by those that preserve the usual inner product. And this symplectic group sort of also appears in more mathematical treatments of Clifford um, operations in mathematics. Okay, so I haven't even said what Clifford's are now, but I hope you probably already know, because this must have been said before. It's just the normalizer of the Pauli group in the unitary group on, on n qubits. So, in other words, a unitary operator is a Clifford if and only if, when you conjugate a Pauli, uh, you get another Pauli back again, right? This, this is a, pro a tensor product of n things and you get some other Paulis back again. So clearly the Pauli group is a subgroup of the Clifford group because, you know, Pauli group is closed on the multiplication, so this is going to certainly keep you inside. Um, but we're interested in things that are not Pauli and especially entangling gates across more than one line. Of course, the, the Pauli operators, they're all, product, they're all product operators by definition. So they all act separately on each line. We, we, we want to entangle lines and do interesting sort of things on two or more lines. 
Uh, okay, so, and it's known very well what all these things actually are. So this is, uh, oh, seems to get on and off here. Oh. So, uh, um, so this is a kind of formal mathematical definition, but we can be very explicit. In, in the case of qubits, um, the Hadamard, I've called it S here, actually I called it T before, and I think I'm going to call it S from now on. Um, I think um, Ernesto called it T, but, um, uh, and I think T is probably the right thing to call it, because <laughs> Nielsen and Chuang called that, but I always get confused and usually call it. Um, so, anyhow, I'm going to call it S, this thing. So these are one qubit uh, Clifford gates and control not, you know, control x, and so therefore you also have control z because you can turn cx into cz with h, and you have swap because, you know, you can make a swap out of three cx's, and you have all the other powerlies, you know, because, well, anyhow, so, because they're in the power group. Um, okay, so, so that those are examples of Clifford's for q bits. And you can easily verify directly that they really are Clifford simply by computing their commutation, their, their conjugation properties on, on the palette. You know, it's, it's only a finite list, so you can easily work all that out or look up some book and find them all listed. Um, so for Q dips, I want the analogues of these things. So these are going to be important, these first three, because in a moment I'll say that they generate arbitrary Cliffords. Um, so what's the case of Q-dips? Well, the controlled not and the controlled Z have these natural generalizations. So the control, you have a control here which now has D values and the target Q-dip. So the J, when the control set to J, it means you hit the target J times with X. So it's a kind of natural multi-target you know, multi-generalization of just having zero or one here. And similarly for control Z, you hit it with Z J times. So you one time gives you omega to the K, so it'll give you omega to the J K. So it's that. And, and here you add one J times. So you get K plus J added off mod D. So so these are, are the natural you know analogues of these guys, but but what about H and S? So these are much more interesting. Um, H, H is many things, but one of the things it is, is the quantum Fourier transform mod 2, right? Two dimensions. And indeed, it's the quantum Fourier transform that we get here. So for Q dips, the analog of H is F, the good old, you know, our best friend in the whole object, the quantum Fourier transform mod D, which just has these matrix entries away. Um, S is a complete mystery. So S is a remarkable animal. The, the generalization here is, um, it's, a, it's again a diagonal. Remember the, the Q big one was 1i on the diagonal. So here, again we've got just diagonals with phases, but look at what these phases are. The powers increase quadratically as you go down, which is a rather weird thing. And I say here for d equals 2, it gives you s as for qubits, so that's wrong, so um, it doesn't. Um, because if you, put, if you put j equals 0, so let's think, what is this d equals 2? Omega is minus 1. If j is 0, you get 0, so that's fine, you get 1 there. But if j is 1, you get 1 times 2 over 2. Um, and you might think you should just cancel the 2s, so you still get the wrong answer. It's one mod i, but even worse, this should really be computed mod d, this index. And 2 is the same as 0 mod 2. So, so this power is really 1 times 0 over 0, uh, if you apply this formula, which is completely nonsensical. So, so, so what do you do? You kind of throw up your hands in horror and say, what could this be? Where do I get this thing from? Well, then you, you go back and there's, there is a way of understanding where it comes from without you know, having to be too sophisticated. So remember, we're interested in conjugation action. So let's think of just single qubit level, right? On the single qubit level, 
um, H and S, what do they do? So you want to kind of churn the powerlies around, you, you know, to get all the all the permutations you want. So when you conjugate H, conjugates X into Z and Z into X. You never get to Y using H, right? Y is X Z essentially. Um, whereas, so that's what S does for you. S saves the day, and S conjugates X into Y. And, um, and Z into itself, it commutes with Z because it's diagonal. Um, so the, the crucial thing is that it turns X into Y, and now you, you've got, at the one qubit, qubit level, you've, you've got all the permutations you want. You can make everything out of that. So, so therefore, at the Qdit level, what we should be looking for is some, let's look for a diagonal <coughs> matrix with the property that it commutes x into xz, which is like the analog of y. Um, because again, uh, you see, again, the Fourier transform um, conjugates x into z and z into x inverse, in fact. So you, you never get to the xz, the, the y thing there. So we want some, this s thing to do that job for us. So, so you just get a big sheet of paper and you write down your, you know, in say five dimensions or something you can imagine, you write down your x um, and then you, and you, you imagine, you, you start guessing what these things are and pretty soon you'll, you'll discover that this pattern of powers does the job. And then you kind of generalize it and you find this quadratic ball for these things. Okay, so, so the key feature of this thing is that it conjugates x into xz. Um, and that enables you to get a sufficient richness of permutations when you fill out the Clifford group. Okay, so and having said all that, the theorem now is for prime D, prime dimension, uh, these the Fourier transform this S thing and, and the CX and the CZ are all Cliffords and any Clifford on NQ dits up to overall phase uh, is a circuit of, of these gates. Okay, so these generate all Cliffords on Q dits. Uh, the Q, and this prime can be two here, right? This works for Q bits. And the Q bit version was, you know, I think shown a long time ago by Gottesman in his, Dan Gottesman in his PhD thesis, I think. Um, and the case for Q dits is a bit more complicated. And, and if you look in Appendix A of this paper, of a former student of mine, you'll um, find an elementary proof, you know, a proof that only requires, you know, primary school mathematics to follow, but, but um, requires a little ingenuity to find the argument. Uh, so, 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 so all that's known, so that's, that's all very satisfactory if, if we, uh, we can get our hands on Clifford's very explicitly. Uh, okay, so, so, okay, so, so much for you know, Clifford's and Pauli's in Q dits. Now I want to come back to Q um, bits. Um, so, in other words, forget about all this stuff I've just been talking about and just return back to normal life with Q bits. Um, and let's start talking about classical simulation. I haven't said anything about classical simulation yet. But, so, um, the, the key thing here is this, this is gottesman knill theorem which everyone always quotes as Clifford computations are classically simulatable, right? Now that's certainly not true at all in any reasonable sense. Um, Clifford computations are classically simulatable only if you're very particular about exactly what you allow as your resources in this computation. Um, so, and and I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on that. We'll see some rather bizarrely interesting examples. Um, Okay, so uh, what do I say here? So yeah, so in the usual, you know, like if you read Nielsen and Chuang's textbook, we have this notion of stabilize a state of n q bits. It's any pure state obtained from all zeros by Clifford operations. Uh, so so any state occurring in a Clifford computation must be a stabilized state, right? 
because you have all computational basis states, because you just use axes to turn zero into whatever you like, and axis Clifford. You get highly entangled states, you can make these cat states with one Hadamard and lots of controlled knots. Um, you, you can make the cluster state, you know, the standard two-dimensional cluster state of measurement-based computing with just some Hadamards and controlled Zs, as we've seen many times. And, and this has rich enough entanglement for universal quantum computing. So, so Clifford operations are by no means trivial in the quantum states they produce. And the, the most basic form we've got the Grossman Knill theorem, which I guess I should say came from quantum error correction theory initially. It's just a kind of afterthought about the stabilizer of formalism for quantum error correction codes. Uh, so the theorem in its most simple form is the following. If the input state is a stabilizer state, so you might as well take it to be all zeros, and the circuit is all Clifford's, then, and the output is a measurement of a single line, then it's strongly, efficiently simulatable in a classical sense. Okay, so it's the best, best possible thing you can ask for. Um, okay, so that, that's one form of, of cosmic control theorem. There are many proofs of there are many different proofs, and you might say, well, that's just a kind of waste of time, we'll just pick one, but it's not, um, because it's always good to have many different perspectives on the same thing because they all suggest very different generalizations, natural generalizations, completely different. One thing will suggest something you would never ever think of using the other formalism. So here's, here's the most common proof of the Gosman Knill theorem, and I've just kind of bullet pointed it out because I don't want to actually go through this proof. I've got a much simpler proof on the next slide. So, uh, <laughs> but, but I think you should be kind of aware of this because this is the one that comes out of the quantum error correction, and this is the one you find in Nielsen and Chuang over you know, several pages where a couple of paragraphs would have sufficed, I think. So, um, so, so the basic ingredients here are stabilizer states, which I've already mentioned. So another characterization of a stabilizer state, you show that it's, it's a unique state that's the plus one eigenstate of all the operations of a subgroup of the Pauli group. Okay, so stabilizer states it can be characterized in that way. So for example, it's easy to show that the all zero state is the unique state that's um, that's the plus one eigenstate of a subgroup of the Pauli group because the, the all zero state is stabilized by a z at each slot. Right? If you put a z, hit, hit each slot with a z, it just gives you back one times a zero again. Whereas if you had a one there, you get a minus sign coming in from z. So, so if you look at the subgroup of the Pauli group, which is generated by a single z in each slot and identity everywhere else, then the all zero state is the unique state that's stabilized by everything in that subgroup. Um, and, and similarly, therefore, when you apply Clifford operations, uh, the, it's easy to see that the subgroup that stabilizes the state just gets changed by conjugation by that operation, and you still stay a subgroup of the power group. So that kind of proves this, basically. So, um, anyhow, so I don't want to label this thing. As I just said, um, and, and then you get the second. Actually, there's a misprint here. Any sub, the Pauli group on n qubits has exponential size of about four to the n because in each slot, in each of the n slots, you can put an i, x, y, or z. You can put four things, so there's four to the n possible things, and then you've got some plus and minus i's and stuff at the front, which just bump you up another couple of powers. But so it's exponential in n, um, but any subgroup has a description via order log of the size of the subgroup generators. I'm not, not um, n here, this should be log of the size of the subgroup, which is at most 4 to the n, because that's the whole group, and the log of that is just linear, it's n. Uh, so every subgroup can be described by a linear number of generators, a linear number of these Pauli products, and so even though stabilizer states, when you write them as states with amplitudes, have exponentially many non-trivial amplitudes, because you know, they're entangled states generally, there's always a poly-sized description, namely order n times log of the size of the group, which is at most n again, so order n squared here, I should say. Um, you just list the generators and say psi is that unique state that's 
kept invariant by this list of n powers here. Um, and that's a completely polysized description. And then it's very easy to see that if you update a state by a, a Clifford operation, or indeed any unitary, the, the group that stabilizes it just gets updated by the conjugate. Um, because, you know, if you take this element and stick it here, the, the, u's, the u's kill each other off, g preserves that, and then the u gets you back again, so you get you're back to the same state. So, so it's easy to update the stabilized description, and then you can also see that if you make a measurement on one of the qubits, the probabilities of the outcomes can also be easily computed. That requires a little bit more work um, from, from this stabilized description. Okay, so this is basically the standard proof, and everything here is kind of polynomially sized in the computations. Um, but if you can read this, I mean, what a good color to choose. Um, this method does not work if the input state is not a stabilizer state, because then you, you don't get off the ground. You haven't got a stabilizer subgroup to work with. So, so kill all that. And um, we have a much simpler proof here, which is not only simpler, but even more general. So here's what I call theorem one, uh, just because I can refer to it, I give it a number, theorem one. I suppose I should call it theorem zero. So if if you have a circuit of Clifford gates on n qubits, so I call them u1 up to un, you know, they act the input states here and they act 1, 2, 3, and so on, polysized one. And now the input's allowed to be any product state. Uh, it doesn't have to be computational basis and it doesn't have to be a stabilizer state, any product state. Uh, so the previous proof's not going to work. Uh, the output measurement again is on a single line and without loss of generality it could be on line one because after all you've got swap gates if it's some other line you can just swap it to the first position before. Um, then the output is strongly classically simulatable. Okay, and this this proof here is is what my question, the main bit of my question for this lecture refers to. So everybody wake up at this point. <laughs> um, so, so the proof, in fact, is very simple, which is why it's, it's the object of the question. Um, so if I write Z1 to be Z in the first slot, like this, then remember that you know, Z is 1 minus 1 on diagonal, so you can write it in the Dirac notation like this. And the output state of the circuit is C, you know, the circuit applied to the input state. It's kind of obvious. Um, and because Z here, which the line I'm measuring, is projector 0 minus projector 1. Those two guys will give me the, the expectation values of the probability. So probability that I get 0 minus the probability that I get 1 is simply the expectation value of this guy in the final state. Right? It's just elementary quantum mechanics. Um, and now if you, if you look at I should have written this in really. So, um, so first of all, instead of thinking of the C's as acting on the states, I'll think of the C's as hooking onto the Z. I simply re-bracket it this way. And now, I can see here is UN, UN going down to U1, and C dagger is UN dagger going back to U1 here. So what you're looking at here is simply Z1 conjugated by UN, conjugated by UN minus 1, conjugated boom, 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 all the way back to conjugated after capital N steps all the way back. And then you work out this expectation value. Um, but, but since we're, all this Cliffordy stuff is applying, the, this is a Pauli product, so when you keep conjugating it, you stay in the Pauli group, and at each stage it's just a product of Paulis, and it's easy to update what the next one's going to be, because you know, when you apply a Clifford to some lines, the, the power, only the Paulis of the lines on which you apply the gate to change. So it's only one or two of them. So it's very easy to update this thing. And at the end of the whole thing, you get some product of Paulis, which is very easy to compute. In fact, in linear time, in a number of steps. Uh, because at each step, you only need to change either one or two in this string. Uh, so, so that's fine, and, and now, um, uh, whoops, so, so now the input state is a product state, and the Pauli 
group has only product operators in it. So this, um, this expectation value here is a product operator with a product state. It's, it's not a great big exponential computation in two to the n dimensions because it factorizes. The, the separate PIs hook onto the separate A's. Um, and, you, and this great big thing is simply the product of all the individual lines, the AI, PI, twiddle, AI. And these are just two by two calculations. And n of them, you multiply them all together, clearly all very easily computable efficiently. And so you get the difference of the probabilities and they sum to one so you get probabilities. And that's an explicit classical strong simulation. Uh, so this is a kind of Heisenberg-y thing which Ernesto mentioned too. He, he thought of the Heisenberg thing as, as evolving the stabilizer group generators. But here what we're actually we're not quite doing that. What we're doing is instead of notice we're not actually getting a description of the evolving state at all. You know, um, we get the answer without the states. Because what we're doing is instead of evolving the input state to the end and keeping track of what it is, we're taking the final measurement and using the Heisenberg sort of method to evolve it back to the initial state, but leave the initial state the same. Uh, so, so this is a kind of back evolution of the final measurement rather than a forward evolution of the initial state. Uh, and so anyhow, so that all works. So, so that's all terribly simple and very satisfactory. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so that's kind of the, um, you know, grossman Knill theorem, at least in its most basic form. Um, so now I want to consider allowing extra ingredients to sneak in. So I'm going to consider four different binary possibilities. So let me just run through what they are. So I'm going to consider, is there a difference when you, the inputs are required, allowed to be only computational basis states compared to general product states? Okay, so we, we saw that this made a difference in the previous proof because the, the, the stabilizer proof works for this, but not for that. Whereas my, the new simple proof works for both. You know, of course, this is a special case of that. So, so that's my first distinction. The second thing I'm going to allow is um, measurements within the circuit. Um, so either you have no measurements along the way in the circuit, which is the usual situation. It's um, you know, fully unitary circuit, as, as we've been talking about. Or I'm going to allow you in addition to Clifford gates in the circuit, you can do non-destructive measurements in standard Z measurements, you know, on each, on a cubic line, within the circuit. So, um, you know, you can measure one of the cubics and get an answer zero or one, and you're allowed to use the post-measurement state if you want for future gates. It doesn't get killed, it's, it's non-destructive. And, and furthermore, subsequent gates after the measurement are allowed to be chosen adaptively according to measurement outcomes. You know, if I got a zero, I'm going to apply an X here. If I got a one, I'm going to apply a, a Z there instead, or something like that, right? So, um, so this is called adaptive um, circuits because you can adapt the, the gates according to previous measurement outcomes. Now, so I'm going to distinguish these two things: no measurements at all, or allowing measurements with adaptive choices. So the natural question is, well, why didn't I say, let's have measurements, but not adaptive you know, that's already kind of doing more than just unitary things. But in fact, it's not. It, it, we'll see in a moment, trivially, that if you allow measurements, but don't use the outcomes to adapt the future circuit, then that's trivially equivalent to not having any measurements at all. Right? We'll see that in a minute. So that's why I, I'm not... I'm introducing adaptation. So that's a second binary choice, either no measurements or adaptive ones. The third choice is the outputs. Either you have a single line output or you have many lines outputs. Okay, so this, this is also going to make a crucial difference. Um, you know, for, obviously you can't have more than n output lines, but it could be of order n, it could grow with n. And the fourth distinction is this familiar thing, I'm going to ask for either a weak simulation or a strong simulation. 
And of course, when we have a strong one, we know that we have a weak one. But if we have a weak one, it doesn't necessarily imply that we have a strong one. So you've got these four possible things. And so there's 16 combinations of all of these. And um, in a recent paper with Martin van der Nest, we, compute, we worked out the simulation complexities of all these 16 possibilities. And many of them are straightforward and well known, but a couple of them are interesting. And I'm not going to list them all here, but I'm just going to pick my favourite one or two to illustrate for you how bizarre Clifford circuits can become, these apparently harmless things that people regard as being so benign. So, first of all, um, so for example, theorem one that we had is we remember the inputs could be arbitrary product states, there were no measurements, there was a single line output, we've got a strong simulation. So that's one of the 16 possibilities done in theorem one, right? So, um, so first of all, before we start, this issue about non-adaptive measurements. If we allow measurements in the circuit, but we don't use the outcome to you know, choose other gates, then that's equivalent to no measurements because of this little picture here. So suppose here's our circuit and we measure this line in the middle here, and we get you know, the collapsed output 0 or 1 for the measurement, and we're allowed to continue using that in the circuit if we want. But we're not allowed to choose gates according to whether this is 0 or 1. Uh, that's exactly equivalent to just probabilistically just decohering that line. So what you do is in, you don't measure it. Instead, you introduce an extra ancilla qubit in state 0 and do a controlled knot and then throw that into the trash, right? The usual thing of totally decohering a qubit. And so the reduced state of this green blob here on this line becomes a probabilistic mixture of 0 and 1, which is exactly the same probabilistic mixture that you get out of this measurement. So therefore, this non-measuring situation is exactly the same as this measuring situation. And furthermore, um, it's very fortunate that this control non-operation that we need to, to put this into effect is a Clifford gate. So we're still using Clifford gates, right? So, so that's very good. So, so therefore, non-adaptive measurements within the circuit are also included in theorem one. They can be strongly efficient in some way. Okay, so let's move on to something a bit more interesting. I just want to do two two sorts of things, so, and then say a different subject at the end. So uh, I can't remember when I started, but I think I still have plenty of time. But so. Um, um, Okay, so the power of, adap of adaptive, so the question is, non-adaptive gates, you know, in, in the theorem of one situation, uh, we know, you know, can be efficiently simulated strongly, don't do anything, but what if we now allow adaptation? So, so this makes a world of difference. So consider theorem one with, um, so product state inputs, um, measurements along the way now, adaptive gate choices afterwards, single line output measurement, okay, so, and strong or, or weak simulation, let's ask what we can do. Well, first of all, um, strong simulation now becomes NP-hard, so very, or even sharp P-hard, becomes very hard classically, just by the act of adapting. Um, even if the, um, this, is, this turns out to be true even if the input states are restricted to be standard basis, computational basis states, not even product states. So, and, and the reason is very simple again. All these reasons are simple, that's what's a good thing about this subject. But they're just slightly tricky to think of, they're like little puzzles to solve. So how on earth would I show that? Well, basically I want to argue that I can compute this sharp P thing again, you know, given a, I want to count how many ones a Boolean function has. And you can do that now easily because with Hadamard's and measurements, I've got classical random bits easily, right? Um, with, with adapting and, and my control not operation, I've got the classical, I've got the Toffoli gate, the control control not, because I can now measure a line and, and control and apply a control not gate on another two lines according to whether it was zero or one. So I've got a control control not, but it's not a quantum control control not because 
The, the first control here is the measurement output. It's kind of a classically controlled CX. But, but if I apply this quantum CX only to computational basis states, I do get the full classical toffoli gate on those three lines. So, so basically I've got classical random bits, I've got the classical Toffoli gate, and that's known to be universal for classical computation. The Toffoli gate by itself is universal for classical computing. So basically, um, in this scenario that I'm considering, as, as a special part of it, I've got universal classical computing. Um, and hence, um, as before, the very same process I wrote down, you take a random input to your Boolean function and you compute it and you measure the output, which is weakly simulatable. If you could strongly simulate that, which is what I'm asking here, you could compute sharp f just as before. So therefore, this strong simulation of this is even more powerful, it's more powerful than computing sharp f, and, and hence it would imply that p and np and sharp p all collapse. Um, so strong simulation is completely out of the question, but uh, you might say, well, who cares anyhow, because you know, strong simulation is just a kind of mathematical nice thing to study. Physics never gives you that. You know, the quantum process itself doesn't give you a strong simulation. It only gives you a weak simulation of its output, a sample. So what about weak simulation in this thing? Um, before, um, uh, okay, so strong simulation is very, very hard. And it turns out that weak simulation is quite hard, but not as hard. It, um, with general input states, it's what I call quantum computing hard, QC hard. Because as I will see in a second, it's in fact another simple argument, is that um, within the, the resources we have here, it's possible to represent any quantum circuit at all. So if it was weakly classically simulatable, it would mean that all quantum computing was weakly classically simulatable, so BQP, you know, quantum poly time would equal classical time, BPP. So, so weak simulation is, is not as hard maybe as, you know, strong simulation, but it's still rich enough to include all of quantum computing. Uh, and, and why do I say that? How do you say that? So this is not just another full picture here. Um, so let's see, what's the reasoning? So remember the Clifford's, uh, this HS, so these are just the qubit of Clifford, so this S is that one I, you know, thing on diagonal. So, so it's known that if you throw in almost any other single qubit gate, it becomes universal. In particular, I think it's already mentioned that if you take the square root of this s, the square root of i being e to the i pi over 4, if you toss in this gate as well with the Clifford's, it's a universal set. So, um, so now, um, the point, so therefore, if I could do Clifford's and t as well, I could do universal quantum computing. So how do I, the point now is you can do that, you can apply t within the resources that we're given namely adaptive circuits of Clifford circuits with measurements. So, and, and I think Ernesto actually mentioned this before as well, this magic state idea, but let me just quickly run through it again. Um, so what we do is if, uh, if we want to apply a T-gate on some line, because we need that for our universal quantum circuits, um, what we do is we introduce an extra qubit in state pi, this state here, which I call the pi over 4 state with this phase stuck in here, same one as you have up there. And, what you, and you do the following thing. You want to apply a T-gate here, so what you do is you do a controlled knock back into here, and then you measure this, and you get either 0 or 1 as your answer. Then it's an elementary calculation to see what effect this measurement has on, on this Qubit, this green qubit line, and if you get um, b equals zero, it turns out that this phase does in fact give you the t gate on this line. But if you get b equals one, you don't get the t gate; you get its inverse. Uh, you get the e to the minus i pi over four there, which you don't want. We want t gate. Uh, so, but we're allowed to adapt. So. Um, 
if, if you get B equals zero, you, you do nothing to the green line. And if, but if you get B equals one out of your measurement, you put another S here. S is T squared, so that bumps up the T inverse to the T to the plus one. And, and hence, either way, you get your T applied to this line, and you get another phase coming out when you do the calculation. So, so basically, within our resources that we're allowing, Clifford gates, this, this just gives you more product, product state inputs, but not computational basis ones, and measurements which you can adapt, you can, you can do universal quantum computing. So, very simple. And furthermore, when you do this measurement, the probabilities are always a half a half, regardless of what any of these states are. It's a bit sort of like teleportation, where you're not supposed to get any information about the states by probability distribution. So that's the same thing. This is really a kind of a one-bit teleportation, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and, and you can check all these things. It's an elementary calculation that I won't, I won't require you to do it. Yet, so. Uh, okay, so, so that's rather interesting that weak simulation uh, is um, rich enough to do universal. So, so this scenario is rich enough to do adaptive gate choices here is rich enough to do universal quantum computing. Now, that, that, that to me is a very striking and bizarre result, and I want to I'll just elaborate slightly on why. I think this is one of the most striking results that about classical simulation that I've ever seen, and, and here's, here's the reason. So, um, let's just step back a little bit and consider what these results are actually saying. So, first of all, We've got Clifford circuits, we're allowing measurements and general product state inputs, and the measurements can either be non-adaptive, in which case you can classically efficiently simulate everything in the strongest possible sense, so that's utterly lame for computing. So on the other hand, the same circuits, but if you allow the measurements to be adaptive, you have full universal computing power, full universal quantum computing power. Now that's utterly bizarre. So, because the the act of adapting um, is a purely classical thing, um, and and so what we have here is a a quantum resource that's classically simulatable. Um, but when you add in a purely classical resource, you get universal quantum computing. So the whole power of quantum computing comes out of classical. In this sense. Um, so you might object and say, well, but, so just to kind of emphasize a bit more clearly, these two situations are the following thing. You do, if the, the green C's are just some unitary Clifford circuits, and introduce the symbol MIY to mean measure the i line and C result Y, you know, the outcome Y. So a non-adaptive circuit looks like this. You, you do some Clifford gates, you do a measurement and um, you, you, you get an outcome, Y1, and then you do some more Clifford gates, but they don't depend on Y1 because you're not allowed to adapt. And then you do another measurement, get another outcome, but you're not allowed to use either of these, you, do, you just do this. Whereas the adaptive case is you do your Clifford, you do your measurement, and now the Cliffords are allowed to be chosen according to whether that was zero or one. And then you do another measurement, and the Cliffords now are allowed to be chosen according to what both of these, you know, any previous results. So, so you have these two things. And A, quantum resources that are no more powerful than classical, um, and B is the same quantum resources plus the inclusion of a trivial, if you like, purely classical ingredient, namely adaptive choice of, of gates. Now you might say, well, I'm cheating here because it's the measurement is a quantum measurement, so you're sampling a probability distribution that's quantumly produced. Um, but I would say, no, no, that, that's not what adapting is used, because after all, in a non-adaptive situation, you still do the quantum measurement, and it doesn't buy you anything. So it's, it's not the quantum measurement that's having the effect, it's the classical use of the classical outcome of that measurement that's, that's causing this, this benefit. Um, so, and, and bizarrely, to an experimentalist, it makes no difference at all. You know, suppose I'm the theorist and I'm 
telling an experimenter what to do. You know, do control not on line one and two. Do this Clifford gate. Now measure the third line and tell me what you get. You know, got one. Oh, now do H on the fourth line. And so the experimenter has got no idea, where, as cannot know whether, whether I'm adapting the gates or not. Because any sequence that I give to the experimenter could have arisen non-adaptively, even if I'm choosing it adaptively. I can't possibly know. So, in other words, the distinction in the lab between A and B is zero. The quantum resources required to implement this are exactly the same. Yet one's universal and one's classical. So this is right, this goes relates to perhaps what Leandro was talking about, this certification of quantum computing. So here you have this utterly bizarre situation. You have a, a quantum process, adapt these adaptive circuits, which can do universal quantum computing, yet any single run of the process, once you tell me what that run was, I can classically efficiently simulate it. So, so I can check whether it did the right thing, you know. So um, very easily, and so it's utterly bizarre that um, a purely classical effect buys you on computing power in this context. Um, okay, so that's um, enough about that. So I think that's, that's a rather bizarre, it's interesting to think about what this is act, you know, what this means. Um, uh, right, so, so just another second. So, so that's the end of all that. So now a, a, another example of the, all these combination inputs. So let's just go back to our simple theorem one again. No measurements, product state inputs, single line output, and we know we can strongly classically simulate that. That's our theorem. Um, so now suppose we ask the power of going from one output line. You might say, well, if you can do one output line, what's the difference if you measure many output lines? It's just more of the same after all, isn't it? Um, but no, it isn't, because strong simulation is now very, very hard again, NP or sharp P hard. Um, the strong, even though strong simulation was trivial, you know, with one line it becomes immensely hard with more than one line. Uh, okay, so, and, and again, there's a simple one. So here's the reason for this, let me quickly go through this. Um, so consider any universal quantum circuit which involves Clifford gates of this T gate. We know that's universal. Remember, T was the square root of that S thing. So here's my circuit. They're all Clifford gates, but somewhere in the circuit there are some T gates, which are not Clifford's. Uh, all the others are. And here's my input state, and I measure some line here, and I get a probability. So this is I'm measuring only a single line now. So this is a general universal quantum circuit with a single line output. So this is everything in BQP is, in, is covered here. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace these T gates by the previous pi over 4 ancilla trick to implement them right, and in extra lines. So, so here's the picture I get. For each, where I had the T gate, the T gates within my circuit, here's my, the output that my BQP circuit was. Okay. So here are these pi over fours, and I do these controlled knots, and I measure these things. But the trouble is, the measurements are 50, 50, 0, and 1, and I can't be sure that I'm going to get 0, but I want 0, because that gives me the T gate I want. If I get a 1, everything's messed up, because I get a T inverse gate, which is going to screw up this circuit. It's, not, it's just not going to work. Um, and furthermore, I'm going to get a, a lot of ones here because the probabilities are always a half, right? So this is not terribly good. But, but, um, see this, the probability that my original circuit outputs something here, its original output probability, is the probability that this whole circuit outputs be here given that I got all ones here, right? There's lots of Zero, I've got all zeros here. There's a zero here for each of the T, I might have loads of T gates here, right? So I've only drawn two in the picture. So the probability that C1 gives B is the same as the probability that C2 gives B on this line, given that all the measurements here can actually did come out to be zero, which means I correctly got my T gates. Now that conditional probability is a quotient of these two marginals. 
of these many, many line outputs. So now this circuit C2 is of my Clifford kind with multi-line outputs. So if I can strongly simulate Clifford circuits with multi-line outputs, rather than just one line output, then I can calculate these probabilities, you know, efficiently to high accuracy, and hence I can compute this probability. And hence I can compute the output probability of that previous thing that computed sharp f, you know, as, as the probability of the output being 0 or 1 or whatever. So hence strong simulation. So going from one output line, which is strongly simulatable, to many output lines in, in the theorem 1 scenario goes from classically simulable to sharp p hard and therefore expanding the number of output lines is by no means a trivial thing to do. It's immensely more powerful competition. Uh, okay, so, and then if you want to look at that paper and look at all the other, I don't know how many, perhaps 13 others left or something, um, but um, a lot of them are, are, are rather easy, but I think these are some of the more interesting ones. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Right, so finally I want to switch to a completely different subject. Um, and this is something I think that Ernesto probably worked on a long time ago. Just, uh, uh, but I only came across this very recently and I thought it was so interesting that I had to tell you about it. So, um, yeah, so, um, so this is Clifford computations of the so called discrete bigger function. So, so the idea here is, is very nice, I think. So the idea is that, you know, if you have a quantum circuit that's classically simulatable, you say, well, it's useless for computing power. But does that mean it's just totally dead quantumly? You know, is it useless as a quantum process? Um, if, if it's classically simulatable, does it mean that, in fact, it's nothing else, if you look at it from the right way, than just some kind of classical stochastic process after all? So, um, you know, is it just no more? Because um, that would mean it had kind of no real quantum interest whatsoever. Uh, so, so this, this relates to the so-called discrete Wigner function, which I'll just say a little bit about now, and which was developed mainly by David Gross, I think, sort of around 2007. And the main thing I'm going to describe here appears in this paper of 2012 by Veitch, and David Gross again, and Joe Um So I want to ask whether a classically simulatable circuit can be represented in a suitable sense, which I can describe now, as a purely classical stochastic process. Um, and the answer generally, I think, is no, but for Clifford circuits, the answer is yes in a very strong way. So Clifford circuits are trying very, very, very hard to be as classical as they can possibly be. Um, but like next time I'll talk about match gates, and it's not known, and I probably not true that the same thing is true for that class of classically simulated or quantum circuits. So, so here's this interesting stochastic formalism that we're going to use. So given any quantum circuit now, I want to introduce a, a space of classical states, which I'll call phase space, that's, it will relate to the bigger function, and they're labelled by mu m, m is just a set of these things, and each input state that I'm allowed to use in like product states or whatever here, um, or say mixed state, is going to be represented as a probability distribution on this phase space. So, um, uh, so the dimension capital D is going to be the dimension of the input space, which for n q dips is, is the dimension of the q dip to the n, you know, for n, n q dip lines. So it's, it's quite a big thing in general. And so, associated to each state, I'm going to have this function rho, for the state rho, at each point of my phase space, which is intuitively meant to be the probability of being in the classical state u when, when you have a quantum state rho. It's kind of representing it as a probability distribution. And of course, we'll want these guys to be positive and add up to one and stuff, but let's leave that rather flexible at the moment. Um, but that's intuitive, that's how you should think of this function, right? It's, it's the probability distribution over mu corresponds to the state row. 
Um, so, uh, so what can we say? What, what can this function look like? Well, to respect classical, because you know, in quantum states, you can classically mix them too, right? You can take a, a row that's a mixture of two other rows, probabilistically, and surely the function applied for this row should be a linear combination of the functions. You know, it's p1 times the probability that you come from there plus p2 is like probably probability that you come from there. So it's very natural to insist that this function, this probability distribution thing, should be a linear function of rho, should be linear in, in matrix elements of rho. So it must look like this, where c's are constants independent of rho, and rho ij are the matrix elements. And this sum over all, you know, all the different matrix elements like this is, is a trace. If you can make a matrix out of these numbers c for, for each point u in the phase space. You uh, call matrix A, I guess you switch them the other way around, and then this double sum is the trace of this matrix product. So, so the function should look like this, where A, these A mu's are suitable matrices, which we call fade point operators. Uh, they're operators in the space of the same size as rho, and there's one of them for each, each classical state of the phase space. And 1 over d is just conventional, you didn't have to put that in, but uh, people seem to put that there. So, uh, so let's just keep that there. Uh, okay, so, well, next thing we could say is, so we call these phase point operators, these things. They, they kind of tell you how to get the probability of you from the quantum state they bring. Uh, so if the A is a Hermitian, then it's easy to see that the probabilities are all real, okay? Um, because, you know, if, if A is Hermitian, Rho is of course Hermitian, and A Rho is not Hermitian, you know, because product of Hermitians is not Hermitian, but A Rho plus Rho A is Hermitian, right? Um, and the trace doesn't notice the order, so, so it's easy to see that the trace of A rho plus rho A over 2 is the same as the trace of A rho, and hence that's Hermitian, and, and, and this will be real. Uh, because the trace of the Hermitian operator is always real, the eigenvalues are, are real. But they might be negative, of course. Um, and furthermore, if the A's all add up to 1, add up over the phase space, or add up to D times identity, because this one over D, then, it's, then the probabilities, these things, will add up to 1. So that's all good. We've got the normalization and, and they're real if, if we cook up these A's, to, if we can find A's that satisfy this increasing range of conditions. So now I want to consider a gate. If I apply a quantum gate to my quantum state row, so this is, it updates, you know, this is density matrix, so we've got to do this conjugation thing. Um, I want this update of the state to be represented as a classical stochastic process on the phase space. So, um, in other words, um, so you, you, you do that as follows. So, I want the new probability distribution for my new state here, which must be this, with the previous formula with a rho prime, the new state in place of rho. Um, well, if I put in rho prime to that, I get u rho u dagger, but since it's a trace, I can move the new dagger over to here, and now think of this conjugation as hitting the A instead of the rho. Okay? So, and I want this to be a stochastic process on, on the phase space. So what I'm going to impose is that when you have a unitary, if you conjugate the A with it, you simply get a linear combination of A's back with positive coefficients that add up to 1. In other words, it's a stochastic um, process, and these k mu nu's will then be the probability of the transition of phase point nu going to phase point nu. Uh, and, and, and hence, the update from my initial distribution to the new distribution is simply the stochastic process defined by these k's because of this formula here. Because uh, you get k, because this thing in here becomes k mu nu a nu. So then you take all the k's outside and you get your old ones updated by this matrix. So it's the usual classical formula. 
So if I impose this condition as well, then my quantum gate can be thought of as an actual classical stochastic process. Of course, I might not be able to do that. I'm not claiming that you can actually do this for quantum gates, but if you can, it means they're, they're really classical things, so, or they can be viewed as such. So final ingredient then is for measurements, right? So the other thing. So if you do a general POV measurement, like you, know, you think of it as a projector onto an orthogonal basis or whatever, so EK with outcome K, the Born rule, the usual quantum rule, is the probability of K is the trace of you know, rho times EK. It's just the usual formula. And uh, so we're going to represent the, the outcome measurement K by, again, a classical object, a function on the phase space, which tells you the probability of getting outcome A from any point in the phase space. Uh, so this G for the outcome K at mu is the probability that you'll see outcome K if you measure the classical phase point mu. Um, and so for rho, if you do the measurement, the probability that you get K is now going to be by the classical law, it's the sum over all the phase space points, of the probability that you're at that phase space point times the probability that that phase space point gives you outcome k and you add up that over all the all the, all the views. So that, that's the classical formula that must apply for us, but we want that to reproduce the Born rule, right? Which it might not. So the question is, how can we choose this formula to, to make sure we get the Born rule? And you can do that as well. So you just, you just impose more and more stuff on these A's. So if the A's, in fact, not only have all the things that we've demanded so far, but if they're also orthogonal with this trace in a product, in other words, if trace of the product of two different ones is zero, in this sense, okay? So this is like an inner product on operations, that's often used in quantum information. Um, so if they're orthogonal like that, then it follows that the um, uh, the free state rho, um, if it's an orthogonal basis, then the probability of being at, at mu is simply this thing here, which is that inner product of um, rho with a mu, and we have that, if, if you're given a probability distribution, you can reconstruct the quantum state it came from by just taking this sum of the probabilities times these phase point operators. Because if I now plug this guy into here, with a different u or something here, then because of this condition, the trace is going to kill all the terms except the relevant one, the mu, and you get precisely this thing here. So, um, so if you have this orthogonality condition, then not only can you go from the state to the distribution, but the distribution back to the state again. And, and now if you plug these formulas all into, um, or actually, first of all, if we, if we plug in rho as one of the AUs, then uh, uh, into here, if rho is one of the AUs, then this expression now tells me that the whole probability is concentrated at that point mu, you get one and all zeros. So in other words, the A mu's, these phase point operators, are what the density operator should be for that pure classical state. Because it's probability of one of being at mu and zero of being elsewhere. Uh, so, that is, so, so if you do that, then um, uh, uh, if we plug in all these formulas, I perhaps I'm sort of probably going over time, but um, if you plug it all in, that you now reproduce the Born, the Born rule really does come out of that classical probabilistic thing. So, so I've run through a whole lot of conditions, so the big question is, can we find such a set of A's that satisfy this immensely long uh, set of constraints? And for Clifford circuits, you can. This, all this actually works, you can do this for Clifford circuits. And it's this rather elegant thing which depends very much on, on properties of the power and Clifford group. And um, I'll just outline the ingredients here because you know, there's a lot of algebraic manipulation to prove all these things. 
you know, depending on these commutation relations to the TABs I had and all that sort of stuff, but just to see what you get. Um, uh, so for Clifford's on n q dits, so this works for q dits, we have this TAB thing here. Um, and remember that up to overall phases, Clifford conjugation uh, maps these guys into themselves, but with overall phases. Um, however, a magical thing is that if you redefine these T's with special phases at the front, namely omega to the a dot b over 2, minus a dot b over 2, where a and b are these, you know, these strings of integers mod d, and this is a usual dot product a1, b1 plus a2, b2, and so on. Uh, if you define that, then when you do Clifford conjugations, you don't get any new phases, and these guys just go into the, each other with no, no extra phases coming out. So if you as a Clifford and W are these special guys with these special phases attached, then the conjugation by a Clifford gives you another one of these W's with no extra stuff at the front. And furthermore, the new index, the new AB index, is obtained from the old one. Alpha here is, is the 2n, you know, it's, it's the vector that's made by sticking these n to n, these two vectors of length 2n now. So it's always updatable by a linear transformation plus a constant, where the linear transformation is one of these symplectic matrices. Okay, so, so I guess we don't really need to know what that is, but it's just a, a big linear thing, so the update is easily computable. And you can easily check this explicitly for the basic Cliffords that you don't get any extra phases and, and that this formula holds and then it must hold for all Cliffords because all Cliffords are generated by basic Cliffords circuits. Um, so, so you have these W's and now in terms of these W's, so I'm just writing formulas here, um, uh, we can label our Clifford things by their actions, this F, this matrix and this constant and when you define our phase point operators, if you define A0, so I'm going to have a phase space that's d, d to the n by d to the n, which is the number of entries in the density matrix as well, which I guess is good too. So the phase point operator at the origin of, of this thing is the sum of all these W's. Um, uh, So beta here, you know, beta equals zero meaning this thing here. And for all the other places in my phase space, the phase point operator, you just translate it in this sense of conjugating by the, the appropriate corresponding W. Okay, so, so these are just formulas. And, and they're rather bizarre formulas, but there is meaning behind this madness, if you like. It's, it can be seen to be a discrete analog of the usual Wigner function of quantum optics for wave functions. You know, you have, um, if, if you know quantum optics, there's this Wigner function of P and Q for a wave function with variable Q and P is the momentum, if you like, and Q is its position. And, and if, you write, if you look at the formula very carefully for that usual Wigner function of quantum optics, then these expressions here uh, very naturally can be seen to be discrete analogues of this integral being the sum and so on and so on. So, so but I won't elaborate on this. So, um, so, um, so the upshot is then, so this is fine, this is my last slide I think. Um, so you can check that the A's that I've just written down satisfy everything you want, absolutely everything. But furthermore, when you update them by Clifford conjugation, this is a stochastic process that the gate represents, it's even bizarrely more classical than you could possibly hope for, because each of these W's goes to a single other W. So not only are these Clifford gates stochastic processes, they're even deterministic. You know, each phase point goes to a unique other one. It's not, it doesn't even get spread out probabilistically. So, um, so it's quite bizarre. So, in this point of view, the, the Clifford circuits are actual deterministic classical processes. And the only um, probabilistic aspect of Clifford circuits, we, we, of course we know they're all probabilistic, you get probabilities for your outputs. Well, where do the probabilities come from? Well, they come 
only from the fact that the input state is a probability distribution, it's not a pure phase space point, because quantum states are never localized at a single phase space point, they're distributions, but then given that initial distribution, you simply sample it, that probability distribution classically, and then you evolve that sample deterministically by Clifford gates to get your final phase space phase point, and then the probability of the output just comes from, you know, that um, the probability of getting outcomes at each phase space point. So it's quite bizarre that Clifford circuits are very, very, very classical. They're not even stochastic. They're deterministic, um, and, and hence um, uh, that sort of is quite striking. I think it shows that these harmless-looking Clifford quantum things have many, many interesting and rich features that um, not quite clear what all this means, really. So, um, which is, therefore, is a good place to stop. And sorry if I've run over time, but um, next time I'll switch to a totally different subject. So if you didn't follow any of this or slept through it, that's fine. Because <laughs> next time we'll start from zero again. And we'll talk about match gates, which are equally interesting in a different way. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Richard. Any questions? So, when you are talking about the, the scheme with the adaptive measurements, and you said that this has full quantum computational power, mm -hmm. but you need these magic states to, as an input. So, because you are saying that, okay, Clifford uh, gates are classical and you have also these adaptive measurements, there isn't anything quantum there, but you can, without the magic states, you will not be able to have this. Uh, okay, so you talked about two different, this thing at the very end here. No, no, before. Yeah, okay, before, yeah. Um, I was talk. okay, in that scenario before, I was considering arbitrary product state inputs. Right, and... No, but you this pi over 4. Yeah, okay, so, okay. So without the pi over 4, I'm allowed arbitrary product state inputs, right? Now, if I add extra ancillas in state pi over 4, which happens to be a magic state, which is good, um, I'm still within my allowed resources because adding pi over 4 qubits, it just extends the product state, and I'm still a product state. So I'm not going beyond what I'm allowed to use. You know, the other... The other product states can be qubits too, which are quantum, like you might already have some pi over 4 states as part of your other input. So, you know, that's not, that's not a problem, okay? If there were no magic states that were single, pure qubit states, then you'd be in trouble, right? But fortunately, the magic can be implemented with a pure single qubit state. Yeah, I'm just wondering, here at the end, do you get all possible permutations? Or is it a subgroup of the permutation group? Uh, I think get them all. Uh, I think Clifford, uh, the Clifford group, I think, generates arbitrary permutations of, of the Pauli group, you know. So. so it wouldn't suggest an extension of the Clifford group that could still be similar. No, actually, we, we looked for other, um, uh, it's like the Pauli group is a finite subgroup of unitaries, and so the Clifford's a normalizer of that. So you might play the same game all over again. You just pick another finite subgroup of unitaries and ask about its normalizer. And if it's got interesting handling gates, then you get these interesting simulation results. But alas, there are there are you know the unitary group is very poor in finite subgroups. It's a bit like the, the regular solids, you know, the platonic solids, because the symmetry groups of those are finite subgroups of rotation groups. And, and so it's very discrete. And similarly, the unitary group suffers the same fate. And we couldn't find anything at all interesting beyond the, the Pauli group, really, so unfortunately. I'm sorry. It's kind of a brainstorm question, but uh, in, in the end, when you were talking about these weird characteristics of Clifford circuits, 
do you think it can have anything to do with the De Broglie and Baum's interpretation of quantum theory? Oh, or I would hope not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think so. Um, uh, is there even any discrete version of the program of theory? You know, because you have this quantum potential and that kind of stuff which comes out of Schrodinger equation. I can't think of how that would arise from the, the, you know, the finite dimensional Schrodinger equation, if you like, you know, with matrices and things. It might do. That's, yeah, I've never thought about that. But, so, yeah. <laughs> so, you mentioned about the, the equivalent of the quantum optical linear um, function for the discrete case. I, I, I wonder if there are uh, some uh, equivalent to the other quantum optical distributions like the Rossini or Laura? Uh, I don't know. I don't know any quantum optics. <laughs> <laughs> but there are there are other interesting parallels with, like you know, with the Wigner function in quantum optics. The the Wigner function is positive if and only if you're a Gaussian state. And here, Gross, David Gross proved that. The discrete Wigner function is positive if and only if you're a stabilizer state. So, in fact, stabilizer states are kind of discrete animals of Gaussian states in a very natural sense, too. So, it's kind of interesting parallels that, that are going on here. But I don't know, I think it might be interesting, it might come up with different kinds of models of these other functions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, David Gross' definition of the two linear functions works for prime, prime d larger than two, right? Uh, I think so. Yeah. So uh, are these last results we talked about by Vacheron also only apply to three or you know? Oh, prime, I, oh, I think different does it? I think it works for two, doesn't it? Uh, uh, I think it works for two. Yeah. I mean, composite d is a bit tricky. You know, I didn't mention composite d at all before. Uh, I think for composite D, all those elementary Clifford gates still are Cliffords, but I think the theorem that they generate everything fails, because um, it depends on the number theory of the multiplicative properties of integers mod D, and if D is composite, if D equals AB, then in that algebra, A times B equals zero, right, that equals D. So you don't have multiplicative inverses anymore, and you don't, can't apply the group theory and stuff, so the whole argument kind of falls apart. If you look at that proof I quoted, and you have to do something else, so I'm not quite sure what happens there. So it's, it's interesting that this number theory has this impact in quantum physics. Any more questions? So you showed. Um, for Clifford circuits with arbitrary product input states and adaptive measurements, the classical simulation is sharp e hard. For many output lines. Ah, for many output lines. But the, oh, strong, sorry, the sorry, strong simulation. No, no, sorry, yeah. the, for one output line. Yeah. For, for one output line, uh, strong the strong simulation is sharp e hard. Yes, yes, yes. And also, for many output lines, it's sharp e hard also. Even without. Adaptive measurement. Even with adaptive measurement, it's curious that it gives you the same complexity in, the, in such two different extensions of. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I should. Well, a caveat. It's there. interesting. Mm -hmm. No, no, it might not be interesting because, um, <laughs> no, of course, everything I said is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Some things are more interesting than others, but, um, because um, it, it might be even more complex. You see, I, I'm not. I guess I can't claim that these are. Sharp character, uh, precise characterizations of the complexity. It's just that you can get at least that and maybe even more, but these complexities are so immense classically, it's kind of hard to imagine you could do even more than beyond that. Um, so, yeah, so I guess it's kind of natural um, that things get stuck at these places because they're so immensely powerful classically. 
But you need adaptativeness also when, when you extend it to many output lines, the theorem. Uh, so the no. statement that it's at least sharply hard holds also you need adaptive measurements also, no? No, no, no. no just, measurements just, many, just many, yeah, many yeah. lines. So if you have many lines and adaptive measurements, <coughs> then it's even more. Well, but it might not be any more because, oh, okay, okay. you right. know, sharp P is so it's powerful <laughs> that you have to add something really significant right. to get something more than that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So just continue with the bold questions. Um, so do you believe that quantum computation eventually could be efficiently simulated by classical computers? Oh, <laughs> um, I think it's a film still running. <laughs> no, this is us sometimes. I get into trouble by um, saying that I think it's not necessarily improbable. Um, <laughs> No, I, well, I think, I mean, it's a very interesting question, actually. Um, I, I think I'm probably the person in the world who would place the highest probability, although not a very large one, but much higher than anybody else, that it could, that I would consider that to be a possibility. And um, I think it's surprising that, uh, you know, it's the limitations of quantum computing that are much more interesting than the, the power of it. And the, the fact that you can't solve NP complete problems. And, and you can't do that with classical systems either. So, whereas on the face of it, when you look at first look at the quantum formalism, it's obvious that you should be able to because you have this exponential growth and complexity. In them. But then the measurement restrictions kills it all off. So, and if you're able to, if you write down arbitrary physical laws or even extensions of quantum mechanics as people have in Weinberg's theory of goodness knows what. Um, it turns out that those physical theories have immense computing power. You can do sharp P hard problems trivially. You know. uh, so in fact it's very hard to find a physical theory whose computing power is limited and, and remarkably quantum mechanics just happens to have this property even though it was developed through all this ridiculous sort of atomic physics what, with no <laughs> thought about complexity at all, um, it suggests to me that um, a limitation of complexity could be a fundamental physical principle which would be as significant as, say, conservation of energy in, in determining what new physical laws could look like. So if you want to find what's the next physical theory after quantum mechanics or you know, what's the more correct thing, uh, if you insist that it, it has limited computing power, then that would be a huge restriction on, on what the laws can look like, which is, which is a very exciting thing. It's this fundamental connection between computational complexity and fundamental physics that is most fundamental. Um, and so therefore, for me, it would be immensely pleasing if quantum and classical complexity were essentially the same. They might not be exactly the same, but you know, maybe not as far apart as people like to think. Um, but who knows? I mean, yeah. So there's lots of other aspects of I should go on about this question. Uh, <laughs> another question? No? So I'd like to thank you, Professor Richard.